Hello, my name is Spencer, and in my podcast called The Dictionary, I literally read from the dictionary, but add in my personal comments and stupid jokes to make it more interesting. Episodes are family-friendly, short, and air every single day on basically every podcast platform. Come join me on this journey filled with edutainment. Hello and welcome to How Did This Not Get Made? This is the podcast all about the movies you never saw, the scripts that were never filmed, and the ideas that never even made it to the page. My name is David Spencer. My name is Daniel Kaka. And I'm Ellis Hoffmeister. Yeah, welcome to the show, Ellis. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to get into it, too. We'll get into our subject in a second. But before we do that, I want to know a little bit about your podcast. So Haley Hoffmeister, my sister, some people think that she's my lover. People can never (laughs) quite figure out. It's either twin or lover. We're very similar in that (laughs) regard. You're not twins? We're not. What? (laughs) <laughs> we have the biggest age gap in our family, but we are super tight. Did you seriously think that? No, I was making a joke, but yeah. Okay, never mind. I'm leaving the podcast now. <laughs> I don't want to do this. I'm done. We're both comedians and actors, writers, directors. And basically, I would talk her ear off about film, and she eventually just had to go, you know, you've talked to me about Nicole Kidman while I'm slamming the bathroom door in your face so many times that <laughs> I think we need to have a podcast where you can just ramble and get all your film obsessions out, and then I can... <laughs> make fun of me, but also support exactly who I am. So, you know, we developed this podcast, If You Like Movies, and every week we talk about a newer film and an older film, mostly comedies. But Daniel, you came on and we talked about Desperado and the Shutter film Host, which I have not seen before. I'm super excited to be here and talk about what we're about to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about Night Skies, which was a unmade, unproduced film, which was going to be made by Steven Spielberg, and eventually branched off into three different movies that actually were made, and we'll explain that one later. Now, the reason why we are talking about this and the reason why, Alice, we have you on is because after I had done your podcast, I mean, we were talking about podcasts before because the way that we met is that I was hosting Zoom shows for Flappers. And you were doing shows with your sister, and I was... You were the tech guy. Yeah, I was just the tech guy. <laughs> yeah. You were the face of the actual show, and I was just the person behind it. I think it was after one of the shows, we were talking about podcasts. We were talking about your podcast, I was talking about my podcast, and basically the Venn diagram is that we both talk about movies. Doing that showbiz thing of everybody talking about the movie podcasts that they make. I don't know if it was the first time we met. It was Haley's show, I think, mm-hmm. at Flappers. You and I both started talking about film after the show, and we both can essentially talk about film while the other one has long since killed themselves yeah. because they don't want to <laughs> listen to us talk anymore. Yeah. And the two of us are still prattling on, not even noticing what has happened. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So that was why I was like, oh, I want to come on your podcast. Yeah. There is a book called The Greatest Movies You'll Never See. Yep. It's like heavy and it has like beautiful art in it. And it's edited by Simon Brond. And it goes decade by decade, all these films that haven't been made. But some of the films that they go into when they talk about Night Skies in it, they talk about Interstellar hadn't fully been made yet. Mm. And it's interesting because what we're going to talk about today is, you know, Night Skies was written by John Sayles and John Sayles came out of Roger Corman. Coppola also came out of Corman and Jack Nicholson and all those people just completely came out of that vein. Yeah, I know that Dan's got his notes and everything, but since we're talking about Spielberg, does everybody want to give their baseline thoughts on Spielberg and his oeuvre? Oeuvre, yes. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like it's very difficult for anybody who likes films to not like a single Spielberg movie, but I think one of the things that I like about Spielberg and looking at his work is you've got like a bunch of different subcategories of things. And for me, I'll say I love Spielberg, the adventure filmmaker who makes stuff like Indiana Jones, and I love Spielberg, the sappy father-son filmmaker with stuff like Catch Me If You Can. The monster movies isn't necessarily something 
something I've ever been into as much. Like, I like Jurassic Park. I think that's a really good movie, but that's definitely not one of my favorites of his movies. And E.T., that was a movie I remember seeing as a kid and just never really getting into for some reason. And I'm leaving the podcast right now. <laughs> I have to get off this podcast. <laughs> I don't have anything wrong with it. It's just for whatever reason, I personally just did not get into it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of the movies like around late 70s, early 80s, kind of family monster movie thing. Stuff like Gremlins I never saw or got into. I feel like this kind of era and this subgenre that I am fairly unfamiliar with. For me and Spielberg, I feel like I'm kind of the product of his era. And we're kind of still living in that era of Spielberg. This idea of being a scrappy filmmaker where it's no longer this idea of like being an elite, like making the movie is part of the fun. And that's kind of what Spielberg really brought to filmmaking. But this was this kind of transition of like being a scrappy filmmaker and loving the process of filmmaking. Whereas before it felt like films were just something that was on a stage and you just kind of filmed what was happening where he really introduced this idea that storytelling can be told through camera angles and through editing through his vision. When we talked about our Jurassic Park 4 episode, how influential that was to me, especially at a very impressionable age of like four years old, five years old was when I saw it in theaters. And I'd basically seen every Jurassic Park movie in theaters after that. Yeah, I've always been drawn to like the action adventure movies that he's done. Even most recently, like Ready Player One, actually it's on my wall. I have right here a signed poster of Ready Player One, which is his most mm-hmm. recent action adventure movie. And I feel like that kind of like brought him back to his roots. These spectacular one shotters it brought me like this nostalgia. I know that he's trying to become a much more of an important filmmaker, trying to go into like heavier subjects, like when he did Lincoln and The Post. But when I saw Ready Player One, I was like, this is the Spielberg that I love. So you like the cinematic OG Spielberg? Yes. Okay. Well, Jaws and Halloween are my two favorite films of all time. Jaws, I've seen so many times and is a huge, complete influence on all my deepest fears. (laughs) Jaws and E.T. were huge for me growing up. Indiana Jones, over and over, Mm -hmm. over and over and over. I, too, have a big fear of chalkboards because of Jaws. (laughs) (laughs) That's a fair statement. (laughs) Actually, my deepest fear is finding a dead body in water, specifically because of Jaws and seeing the trailers for this movie. Movie, this TV mm-hmm. movie with Judd Nelson called Cabin by the Lake or something like that, yeah, where he would like it. chain women under. Oh, it's just Ooh. terrifying looking. <laughs> I'm thinking about just becoming a scuba diver to like reclaim bodies at this point, just to like get over my fear and call it a day. I still remember towards the end of that movie where they're going in the water and see, uh, oh no, I forgot the guy's name. Body Richard in Dreyfus. The water. Yes, thank you, Richard Dreyfus. No, not him. The guy who went out on his boat and he finds the boat. It's, yes, it's the yes, part yes. that they mm-hmm. filmed in Verna Fields is swimming pool and they just like trash bagged it over. <laughs> so yeah, so Jaws is a huge thing. E.T. is huge for me. I mean, I at one point had the like massive collector set of like all the different versions. <laughs> so I'm a big fan of this. There's not like any Spielberg that I don't enjoy. So I saw Jurassic Park when I was really little on VHS after it had come out and it completely traumatized me. <laughs> and I was afraid of going to the bathroom because I was afraid of a dinosaur would eat me off the toilet. <laughs> traumatized me, but I loved it. And it is yeah. funny because of all his films, that's one of the few that I admire. And every time I like see it, I'm like, oh God, it's so good. But I always kind of like forget about it for a hot second. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, oh yeah, that thing. Have you guys ever seen Duel? Okay, oh so yeah. Duel is excellent Duel. if you've never seen it. Dennis Weaver, the guy is just being chased by this mm-hmm. unrelenting truck. And it's such a cool idea. There's no explanation for it. You don't know if it's supernatural or if it's grounded in reality. It's just a thing that's happening. I get frustrated by movies sometimes getting so caught up in the explanations for things that they don't take the time to like explore the implications. The explanation doesn't matter at all. It's all about how this guy is reacting to this situation. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's a theme that has kind of come back around in the last five to 10 years where they've started having more films where you know nothing about the protagonist. And I kind of love that because it makes you have to kind of work to fill it in. The film that immediately comes to mind is John Wick. It gets so quickly into just 
What's the carrot on the stick? The carrot on the stick is a dead dog. Yes. But because of the <laughs> simplicity, you can kind of fill in the gaps as he's going and you're still having a great time watching that movie. On the subject of Spielberg, I am really curious to see how West Side Story turns out. The content of the story, I don't necessarily know if that's a Spielberg story to tell, but I do love the idea of Spielberg making a musical. There's a bunch of filmmakers that I feel like could do a really good job with a musical, and Spielberg is one of those that I've always felt because he's so good at the long one takes with intricate action and the camera moving around. When I was watching the trailer, I was like, this is either going to be really beloved or it's going <laughs> to kind of be like a nothing. Like yeah, people are going to yeah. be like, oh, okay, whatever. It'll be really interesting to see. And I'm very excited to see it because it is his first musical and yeah. musicals are very tough on film and Absolutely. you can have all the right elements <laughs> and it can still just fall apart completely. And Sometimes when they fall apart, like Cats is a glorious disaster. It's the <laughs> hardest I've laughed in a long time, but it's kind of perfect at the same time because Cats is supposed to, as one of my good friends says, it's supposed to just be a whole kind of what the fuck situation. <laughs> I think it was on this podcast. We also talked about how we would love to see Zack Snyder make a musical. Yes, I think he would make a great musical. Zack Snyder, he's so into these big, bombastic musical sequences and these like... Yeah, and needle drops all the time. He'd be perfect for it. Zack Snyder should make a jukebox musical. He should. Well, the cool thing about West Side Story is Sondheim's seen it, and Sondheim oh. will be the first to tell you whether or not something is bad, but I'll be there. Uh. You know, his next movie, is it The Fogelmans? After that, which is based on his childhood, I think it's going to be the really interesting. Fablemans. I think that's going to be another one that gets back to his roots and maybe marries it perfectly for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Perfect segue into Steven Spielberg himself and uh, where he started. Go for it. Steven Allen Spielberg was born on December 18th, 1946 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He came from an Orthodox Jewish family. His grandparents immigrated from the Ukraine around the 1900s and settled in Ohio. Steven's parents, Leigh and Arnold Spielberg, they were a restaurant owner slash concert pianist, and his father was an electrical engineer specifically for computer development. Steven was the oldest of four, having three younger sisters, Anne, Sue, and Nancy, after his father was hired by RCA in 1952, he and his family moved to Haddon Township, New Jersey, and this is where he attended Hebrew school. In 1957, he and his family moved again to Phoenix, Arizona. There is where he turned 13 and he had his bar mitzvah. It was around this time that he began to understand the importance of being Jewish and what that meant to him and his family. He did learn that his father had lost anywhere from about 16 to 20 relatives because of the Holocaust. Quote, it isn't something I enjoy admittingly, but when I was seven, eight, nine years old, God forgive me, I was embarrassed because we were Orthodox Jews. I was embarrassed by the outward perception of my parents' Jewish practices. I was never really ashamed to be Jewish, but it was uneasy at times. In high school, I was smacked, kicked around, two bloody noses. It was horrible. Because of this, he would have to move around to various neighborhoods that also had Jews within the neighborhood. Spielberg first got interested in filmmaking when he created a home movie using his model Lionel train set at the age of 12. When he was a Boy Scout in 1958, he made a nine-minute film titled The Last Gunfight, which he shot on an 8mm camera. The Scouts didn't have a badge for making movies, so they gave him a photography merit badge to congratulate him. Steven was now taking his camera out for every Scout trip that they would go on. When he was 13, he made a 40-minute war film called Escape to Nowhere. He cast the movie with his sister Anne and other classmates. To mimic explosions, Steven asked his father to get supplies from a local drugstore, and he said no. We're not having explosives around. So to work around this, Stephen would actually place dirt on a wood plank, and then the actors would actually have to step on the opposite side of it, catapulting the dirt in the air to mimic bombs exploding next to those characters. I love Very it. innovative. Yeah. <laughs> That's the story about Spielberg I love is that part. <laughs> I love any sort of do-it-yourself stories of filmmaking and all of the weird genius ways people have been able to come up with effects with those limitations. It was so interesting reading about because Rick Baker factors into Night Skies. He basically retired because he just was like, with 
CGI and everything, I don't feel that strongly about doing my work anymore. And the practical effects that Spielberg implemented, he just says, do it yourself, run and gun. And I always have respect for people that do it that way. We are kind of getting this turnaround now where we're kind of wanting this need for the practical. Mm -hmm. We're finally understanding the use of practical plus CGI to enhance or like fill in the gaps. Whereas before it seemed like, oh, if we just have a superhero on a green screen, we can just like fill in the rest behind them. But now we're realizing, oh, you know what we could do? We could actually build a full set And the background will be green screen, but everything in the foreground, everything that the actor interacts with, that needs to be practical because that is easier to recognize. I think that's one of the things I really appreciated about the uh, Star Wars sequel trilogy is all of the new ways they figured out how to be practical, which to me, the most mind blowing one was the fact that Maz Kanata was a CG character in Force Awakens. And then when she's in Rise of Skywalker, she is a complete animatronic puppet. The idea that they took a CG character and then made it practical later on is insane. They also brought back Puppet Yoda. Yep. So back to him being a young filmmaker. So around the same time, he also shot another war film, which was called Fighter Squad. And then throughout his teens, he made about 20 adventure films using that same 8mm camera. Now, Spielberg was also an avid moviegoer, watching a movie every Saturday at the local theater in Phoenix. This is where he drew a lot of his inspiration. He cited that the films that he drew the most from were the 1956 King of the Monsters, 1937 Captain's Courageous, the 1940 Pinocchio, and Lawrence of Arabia, which we definitely see for sure when we watch Indiana Jones. Yes. Oh, yeah. I could watch that movie on a loop till I die. (laughs) What is it, Major Lawrence, that attracts you personally to the desert? It's clean. Phoenix, Arizona is a desert community, and I was raised in the desert, and so I had an affinity for Lawrence's love of the desert and understood his obsession with how clean the desert was, and that's what I always thought that the desert was cleaner than the city and the neighborhoods, that nature just swept all the debris out of the desert and kept it pristine every moment. And it was that moment of Lawrence and nature sort of at one with each other that I really could relate to on that very natural level. A lot of people compare Spielberg to the rest of his contemporaries in like the 70s and 80s of being somebody who's like very interested in like earnest characters who are just like genuinely good people trying to do good as opposed to like a lot of other new Hollywood Scorsese and Coppola type stories. You can see a lot of that as a direct line from something like Lawrence of Arabia. To me, T.E. Lawrence, as depicted in that movie, is like the ultimate movie good guy. Him and And Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird, that kind of earnest storytelling is so apparent in the kinds of movies that Spielberg likes to make. Mm, Peter O'Toole's beautiful blue eyes, too. (laughs) (laughs) Dan and I used to work at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum. That's true. We had a figure of Peter O'Toole as Lawrence, and it feels like he's seven and a half feet tall. Like he's just like towering over everything in the room. (laughs) Yeah. So then in 1961, Stephen attended Arcadia High School for three years. The school is located east of Pasadena, California. While attending school, he managed to make his first independent film, Fireflight, in 1963. It was 140 minutes, and it contained a lot of in-camera special effects, which would later inspire Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Firelight had a budget of about $600, primarily funded by his father. Okay, so... There have been so many stories about Steven Spielberg sneaking on the Universal lot. (laughs) And here's the one that I believe is the most accurate. In summer of 1964, he would have been around 16 at the time. He obtained a three-day pass to get onto the lot in which those three days he consistently showed up every day around the same time each day showing the same security officer his pass. Now, on the fourth day, Stephen passed by the guard, hoping that he would recognize him, which he did, and he just waved him through anyways. He didn't look at his pass at all. For the rest of the summer, for approximately three months, He would show up every day that he could. He would walk on the lot and just watch TV shows and films being made on the back lot. For a brief moment, he actually got to watch Alfred Hitchcock direct Torn Curtain, but he was then kicked off the set. That's the story that I believe the most. Now, there is another story that he took the world-famous Universal Studio Tour. 
And halfway through the tour, they actually would stop for a restroom break on the back lot. So then Steven, he actually just waited in the bathroom. And then once the tour left, he just started to explore the back lot. I don't know how much I believe that story. Every time a interviewer actually asked Steven Spielberg, how did he sneak onto the lot? Because we know he got onto the lot when he was a teenager. Every time his story seems to like change a little bit. Yeah. Are the stories true that you used to sneak onto the lot here when you were a young guy? Yeah. How old? Probably about 16. So you couldn't be tried as an adult at that point? No, I would have definitely <laughs> been taken to juvenile court and gotten a suspended sentence for giving it a good try. But I wasn't caught, thank goodness. I had a pass for three days and I just took a chance. The guard would remember I had been, I had been here on three consecutive so you days. Were regular. I walked in with no pass the fourth day and he waved me through and it was that way for the next three months of my summer vacation. For Spielberg's last year in high school, he attended Saratoga High School and graduated in 1965. A year later, his parents would divorce. Stephen stayed with his father in LA while his sisters stayed with their mother in Saratoga. The divorce was hard on Stephen, and this ended up kind of being a theme for pretty much the rest of his movies. <laughs> yeah. This idea of like families splitting up and then reuniting and coming back together. My parents got divorced at a young age and that experience defined so much of a lot of the media that I consumed at the time and like especially Spielberg stuff like one of my favorite movies as a kid was Mrs. Doubtfire because that's one of the few movies about a divorced couple that at the end they decide to stay separated and it's a good thing. You know, some parents, when they're angry, they get along much better when they don't live together. They don't fight all the time, and they can become better people and much better mummies and daddies for you. One of the big reasons why Catch Me If You Can is probably still my favorite Spielberg movie, just because I saw it at just the perfect age for it to like just leave that impression on me. Mm -hmm. That whole period of Spielberg's career with movies like that and The Terminal and Minority Report, none of these that are seen as like classic Spielberg movies, Munich, but all of them are really well made. And I think they all have something special in them. Eh, maybe not The Terminal, but a lot of those have something special in them that could make them somebody's favorite movie. There's genuine heart and care in them. So... Stephen applied for the film school at the University of Southern California, but his grades were so poor that he got rejected. Instead, he attended California State University in Long Beach. In 1968, Stephen was given the opportunity from Universal to write and direct a short film for theatrical release. With this, he made a 26-minute short called Amblin. Sidney Scheinberg, Universal's vice president, was so impressed with the short that he offered Stephen a seven-year contract to direct television for Universal. Stephen then dropped out of school and became the youngest director ever to be signed as a long-term director. In the fall of 2001, Spielberg then returned to USC to write a term paper for his Natural Science 492 class, which fulfilled his remaining credits to earn his bachelor's degree. So he eventually <laughs> got it. <laughs> and we're back. So Steven Spielberg's first job at Universal was to direct the pilot episode of Night Gallery, which was written by Rod Serling. If you don't know who he is, he wrote The Twilight Zone and was basically the main guy behind it and it starred Joan Crawford. Mm -hmm. Now, at first, she didn't actually take him seriously, she actually thought Universal was playing a joke on her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they were like, What is this PA doing talking to me? But, but after working with him, she had this to say, Quote, When I began to work with Stephen, I understood everything. It was immediately obvious to me and probably everyone else that here was a young genius. I thought maybe more experience was important, but then I thought of all of those experienced directors who didn't have Steven's intuition, inspiration, and who just kept repeating the same old routine performances. This is called experience. I knew then that Steven Spielberg had a brilliant future ahead of him. Hollywood doesn't always recognize talent, but Steven's was not going to be overlooked. I told him so in a note I wrote him, I wrote to Sterling too, I was so grateful that he had approved Stephen as a director. I told him he had been totally right. Joni knew. Yeah. She had her Pepsi Cola and she knew. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the first feature length film Stephen got to direct was a made for TV movie called Duel in 1971. <laughs> 
it was based on the Richard Matheson short of the same title. He would make two more movies, Something Evil and Savage, before he got his chance to direct his first theatrical release movie, The Sugar Land Sugar Express. Sugar Land Express. In 1974, I got yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Steven Spielberg wouldn't really be known until his 1975 blockbuster hit, Jaws. The film was a nightmare to shoot, but it put Steven Spielberg on the map. Side note, if you've never read The Jaws Log and you want to learn about filmmaking, The Jaws Log by Peter Gottlieb is stunning and tells you everything you need to know about filmmaking. I think my favorite quote about filmmaking ever comes from Day for Night, which is something like making a movie is like riding a covered wagon where at the beginning you're trying to have a good time and by the end you're just trying to make it out alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. So I don't want to get too much into Jaws and the reason reason being is because we are going to actually have a separate episode for that because there was another movie that was called Jaws 3 People Zero and we are going to cover that later and we're going to go through the behind the scenes of Jaws and that whole nightmare. (laughs) So we're going to gloss over that for now but that's going to be a future episode. Just to conclude... The film did gross more than $470 million. It did win three Academy Awards for Best Film Editing, Best Sound, and Best Original Dramatic Score, which was composed by John Williams. This was the first time that Williams and Spielberg had actually worked together, and it created this uh, lifelong professional relationship with each other. So we're going to fast forward. Steven Spielberg's career, we could talk about all day. Mm -hmm. There's a whole documentary on HBO Max. If you want to watch that, I highly recommend it. But in between that time from Jaws and E.T., he also directed Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1941, and Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Close Encounters of the Third Kind was a huge hit for Columbia Pictures and was looked at as saving the company from financial disaster. Much like anything that becomes successful, why not try to make it again with a sequel? Now, for Steven, he was not interested in a sequel, but he knew that he would have to do something or Columbia would just make the sequel without him, much like what Universal did with Jaws. Mm -hmm. So Steven had to go on and he actually developed a story called Watch the Skies. The treatment he put together wasn't meant to serve as a sequel, but more of a companion to the film Close Encounters. Now, he drew inspiration from the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter that took place on August 21st, 1955. Spielberg became aware of the story from professor of astrophysics, Alan Hinnick, when he worked as a consultant for Close Encounters. Now, you may have seen him because there was a cameo of him because he actually plays the scientist who's smoking out of the pipe. In the encounter, the uh, Kelly Hopkinsville encounter, Five adults and seven children reported to the Hopkinsville police station that their farmhouse was being attacked by small alien creatures. Elmer Sutton and Billy Ray Tyler, two of those adults, claimed they were shooting at 12 to 15 aliens for about two hours. At first, they saw flying lights, and then they were surrounded by creatures. They described the creatures as being short, dark figures who repeatedly popped up in doorways and peered through windows. To avoid more gunfire, they sent four city police officers, five state troopers, three deputy sheriffs, and four military police from the nearby U.S. Army Fort Campbell to the Sutton Farmhouse located near the town of Kelly in Christian County to investigate. All they found were bullet holes everywhere but no evidence of aliens. When the press reported on this strange story, they described the creatures as, quote, little green men, gremlins, and large pointed creatures, claw-like hands, eyes that glowed yellow, and spindly legs. Now, skeptic Joe Nickel later gave the most plausible explanation of the incident. Those flying lights were falling stars, and the farmhouse was most likely surrounded by great horned owls. (laughs) which were hard to see because it was dark, and the fact that Elmer and Billy were drunk during the, quote, alien attack. (laughs) Let me say, that owl attack was insane. It made the birds look like nothing. It was just... (laughs) Have you ever seen the picture of an owl without its feathers? It's terrifying. Oh, no! So the individuals involved in the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter did not want a movie made about them, and so Spielberg had to change the story enough as to not get sued by those who were involved. 
To help write the story, they hired Piranha screenwriter John Sayles to write the script. Which was great because Piranha is a famous ripoff comedy yeah. kind of thing of Jaws. And I love that Spielberg hired him and he loved Piranha, which oh, yeah. is great yeah. because, you know, so many people, when you do a takeoff of their thing, they get all mad about it. And John Sayles mm-hmm. is fucking brilliant. Before this doing this research i'd never actually seen piranha before and then doing this research i finally watched it and i thoroughly enjoyed that movie it's so much fun paul bartell (laughs) like the howling is one of my favorite movies of all time the guy who when they're in the tent and she goes are you gay to the really tall army officer that's john sales so he often has a cameo because he's a huge oscar nominated writer he really is big in like the independent Mm -hmm. film movement His movie, The Return of the Sakaka Seven, is one of the big precursors to The Big Chill. It's essentially The Big Chill before The Big Chill, along that, along with Between the Lines by Joan Micklin Silver. He basically funded a lot of his early movies. He came out of Roger Corman, and then he did, you know, The Howling, Alligator, Piranha. Wow. His specialty is like creature features. Oh, yeah. He's great at creature features. And then he wrote and directed all these independent films and has like just gone on to this amazing career and just keeps making films. So, yeah, John Sayles. He's in charge of making the script. Now, for the alien creatures, I know we mentioned him before, but Spielberg then hired Rick Baker Mm -hmm. as uh, the special effects artist to make them. Now, we had talked about Rick Baker before, and we actually kind of did a more of a deep dive into him because he did another movie that we covered before called Isobar, or Mm -hmm. The Train is what it was called. Now, I was able to find a leaked copy of the script, and I actually have a plot summary of it that we're going to go over pretty soon. So something that I found interesting about the script that you may have noticed that when you read it was that in the first few pages, there's actually a floor plan of the house, Mm -hmm. which I never see in a movie script before. Usually you'll see like a stage layout for like plays, but I've never seen it in a script before. When we get into this script, it's so funny because you can tell that it's a Spielberg treatment, but it's very much John Sayles. Spielberg said, some people go to the wood shop and make bowling pin lamps, stuff like that. I tell stories about aliens. (laughs) Hello. Hello, Haley. Hi. Look who's joining you. Welcome. We just went through the brief history of Steven Spielberg. (laughs) Did you say the brief history of Steven Spielberg? Uh That's what's happened in the last hour. That's what I've missed. Thank God. Up until this point, yeah. (laughs) We are going to be going over the synopsis of Night Skies. Okay. Haley, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Haley Hoffmeister. I'm one half of Ellis and Haley Hoffmeister. (laughs) We have a podcast about movies together called If You Like Movies. I'm sure you've already said that. But my role mostly is just to be hilarious because Ellis obviously knows a lot about movies. I like movies, but I don't know as much as y'all. Job is just to show up and be funny. Yep. She got me a t-shirt for last Christmas that just says movie dick on it, which is the most <laughs> accurate description of my personality <laughs> to date. It's great. I had to have that specially made. I'm so <laughs> proud of it. I love it so much. Good. I'm glad it's just not this pre-made thing where you just saw it online and was like, I know who would want this. No, you actually like put thought into this yeah (laughs) specifically what he is he's specifically a movie dick and not anyone can be that so we are going to get into the story the synopsis of night skies in the first shot it's moving we follow a field mouse that darts through the grass when suddenly it's snatched up by a hawk's talons we follow the hawk as it flies through the sky the mouse is viced in its claws the hawk lands on a fence post ready to eat the mouse when it's suddenly startled by a sudden vibration in the fence. It flies away. The source of the vibration is from Tess, a girl in her teens, hammering fence poles into the ground. She's with Jaybird, her younger 10-year-old autistic brother who is organizing her tools. For the rest of the plot, we're not going to go into that much detail. I just thought it was a really cool opening scene. I was like, are you reading the screen? <laughs> Daniel's like, I will double down on this. Yeah. <laughs> the reason why I do that is because the ending shot as well kind of mirrors that, and I just thought it was a really cool image to put in there. So I'm not going to go into that much detail. I just thought that was really neat. You want to go into Save the Cat screenwriting, do that opening and closing image. Yeah. <laughs> you got it right there. Your PS oh, too. Yes. Keep it in. <laughs> 
So Jaybird and Tess, they drive to the small town store to pick up supplies and interact with the locals. Jaybird rides a dime mechanical rocket ship while Tess shops. We learn that Tess has dropped out of school to take care of her younger brother. Also, we find out that a lot of the livestock around town have been mysteriously cut up. Skinned, genitals ripped out, skull heads, the whole shebang. Haley's like, I'm out. Yeah. Also, this kind of is a horror film. So it's a hundred percent a horror film. That's why I said it's Spielberg, but it's one thousand percent John Sales. Yeah. On her way back, she runs into her father Ed and other townsfolk investigating the mysterious mutilations of three cows. They speculate it's some kind of voodoo black magic, maybe Indians, most likely the Russians. So, <laughs> back at the farm later that day. <laughs> Watt, an older sibling, continues to work on installing the fence. Suddenly, a beam of extremely white light flashes down from a cloud near him. He jumps up into his truck and tries to escape, but nothing is working. When the light disappears, everything resumes back to normal like nothing happened. He runs back to his family and tries to tell them what happened, but no one believes him. Later that day, Tess is in the chicken coop. She's playing piano as Jaybird gathers all the eggs that have been laid. Vaughn, a back-in-town love interest, his lover. Yeah, stops to pick her up in his truck, and they go out into the woods to have some fun. They fuck in the woods while an alien watches. Let's be honest. Let's call a spade a yes, spade. Yes, they do. I actually have a quote here from the script itself. It says, note, some thought should be put into exactly what an E.T.'s POV should look like. Could it be infrared, black and white? segmented, etc. It will have to be something that doesn't confuse or disorient the audience too much. And this is really where E.T. comes from, the whole name and everything. So Tess believes that there's something or someone out there nearby. Vaughn convinces her that maybe it's a squirrel or a bird. Or a plane or Superman. Yeah. <laughs> and then they continue to canoodle. We don't see the creature, but there are branches that are shaking that implies that he dashed away. Tess and Vaughn, they hang out at the bar and overhear more of the strange attacks of the cattle. The family sits down for dinner as the couple continues to hang out. Tess and Vaughn sit under the stars on top of his truck, just talking about life. The two of them then notice an eerie glow coming from Rinker's Orchard. They drive over there. When they get to the site, the light vanishes. Man in overalls that is rambling. Right in the center of it, there's like this distraught man. He's suddenly met by Sheriff Love, who's investigating the scene. And he's like covered in these strange, what they call strawberry marks that are all over his arms and shoulders. Kind of like they were like suction cups. From octopus, yeah. Octopus aliens. Tess runs back home to tell her family, but unbeknownst to them, they are the next target. When Tess runs into the house, she leaves the door open, allowing Jaybird and their cat Fritz to walk outside and encounter the light. The power goes out and nothing seems to work all around the house. Watt and Ed find a mutilated cow carcass on their land. When Jaybird gets back inside, he sits in his room playing with his marbles. This is where he then meets the alien Buddy. Now, the spelling of this is B-U-D-D-E-E. -E. I don't know why this is relevant. You will notice that each of the aliens have names in the script. They never actually say these names out loud. I think it's just for them to like, when you're reading the script, it's just better to like separate which alien is what. It's very like Gremlins where this whole script, basically the ETs essentially have names and there's Buddy and then there's the Stripe equivalent. I mean, this movie is Gremlins essentially. Yeah, you'll see a lot of that in there. So when I refer to the aliens, I will be saying their names out loud, but know that if you were watching this movie, you would just be like, that's this shaped alien versus that's the slightly taller alien versus this is the slightly wider alien. And that's kind of how we watch gremlins as well. If you were watching them, you wouldn't necessarily like know them. By no, name, you would but not. You know them because of the script by name. Yes. So that's why. Yeah. So buddy, he actually hands this technologically advanced ring that spins like a gyroscope and travels like all around Jaybird. And then while Jaybird is playing with this ring, Buddy then slips away. Ed and Watt are still examining the mutilated cattle. Tess checks on Jaybird and to keep him occupied, she lets him finger paint. Then Buddy joins him as soon as Tess leaves. I just can't not think of the alien fingers. Apparently he had the ET <laughs> alien, the two fingers that just look like penises. And then he spreads paint all over the frogging house. Yeah. <laughs> Ed and Watt spot the ET squirt riding a cow like a horse and Scar, 
observing them from a distance. And that was essentially why this movie didn't get made. It was because the alien riding the cow or horse would be too complicated. (laughs) Ed spots Scar, shoots at him, misses. And from inside the house, Ruth spots the E.T. Clud spying into the house just before he vanishes. Um, it's pronounced Clud. What's the etymology of that? Nothing. I just assume it's Clud, not Clud. <laughs> so everyone gathers back into the house. This time, Ed spots Clud in the window and Hoodoo in the doorway. He shoots at them both, misses both times. Tess goes to Jaybird's room to get him, and she sees Buddy innocently sitting next to Jaybird, and she screams and scares Buddy away. A bright beam of light shines into the house. It's Sheriff Love, here to investigate after hearing all the gunshots. They explain that the creatures are about three foot tall humanoids with grasshopper-like eyes and gangly arms with fingertips that glow. Now Tess attempts to draw Buddy. Love has all that he needs before he leaves Ed and S that his encounter not be spread around as to not give the wrong impression of the family. It's just a mess for this poor family. Oh, yes. <laughs> so after things settle down, Ruth watches TV, but the antenna signal gets disrupted. She fiddles around with the controls, unaware the ring that was given to Jaybird then begins to spin on the coffee table. She looks up, frozen by fear, to see the E.T. hand, which belongs to Hoodoo, is actually on the TV screen and is actually trying to fix the signal. While Grandma is in the kitchen putting away leftovers, she spots the E.T. squirt attempting to eat uncooked spaghetti and she screams. She fights off the E.T. with a broom. Her false teeth falls out of her mouth. The creature then starts to throw random food at her. This is probably like the most hilarious part of the entire movie of just like both of them freaking out and throwing stuff at each other. Remember the scene in Gremlins when the mom like has to put the gremlin in a blender? That is the scene in this screenplay that reminds Mm -hmm. me the most of like anything in Gremlins. It's that specific scene. Yeah. Meanwhile, Tess is taking a bath and then she notices the blue paint leading into the hamper and which is where Buddy is hiding. And then he leaps out and investigates and he is actually standing on the toilet. He accidentally flushes it and freaks out. So he jumps in the bath with her and then she jumps out of the bath and then they run around. Chaos ensues. Ed is in the barn. He's looking at the horses. So Scar, he entrances one of the horses and he makes it kick Ed, which- In the face. Knocks him unconscious, yeah. I don't know if anyone knows about horse kicks. That ain't gonna knock you unconscious. You will die. (laughs) (laughs) Is that something that people need to like be an expert on, Daniel? Like, I don't know if you guys know about horse kicks, but they're really shitty. Something that annoys me so much in movies is when a character like in a fight gets hit with a cast iron pan they just kind of wave it off. Like it's just like this thin stick that they just got hit with because like the the actual (laughs) problem. When has that happened? Tangled. When I mention it, you will start noticing it so often, but. Tangled, I was going to say, are you talking about Tangled? For a a lot of those props, they're just like, they're rubber. So when you get hit by them, you don't really notice it. But if you get hit with an actual cast iron pan, like your day is over. What if everything that Daniel's referring to is about Tangled? It is. He doesn't like that the horse kicks in Tangle aren't realistic. <laughs> the pans to the head aren't realistic. Dan <laughs> no, has a very just... specific beef. What, what if like Night Skies is all just a cover to talk about Tangled? That's <laughs> true. I have a vendetta against Tangled. Oh, I love it so much. Anyway, so Ed has been knocked unconscious. So in the chicken coop, Watt finds that the chickens have escaped because of Clued. Now, Scar enters into Jaybird's room by melting the glass on the window. I don't really understand what his powers are, but sure. When Jaybird reaches out to touch Scar, Scar then freaks out, and Jaybird thinks this is a game, so he just like plays along with this. Tess enters and quickly removes Jaybird. The family retreats back into the house and barricade themselves in the kitchen. While in the yard, Clued, Hoodoo, Squirt, and Scar reassemble for a telepathic strategy session, whatever. They're kind of like standing in a circle and combining all their powers together to make, I guess, Captain Planet. Buddy is inside. He is at the top of the stairs just watching the events unfold. Ruth mentioned that one of the ETs communicated with her telepathically, stating, quote, We were being warned that things were out of hand and something awful would happen if we didn't act better. Very sales because sales really cares about like the environment and he really cares about people. And he's like a filmmaker that really gives a shit. From when I watched 
Piranha was like, you mess with nature, nature messes with you back and tries to kill you. That's kind of his deal. I mean, there's a lot of it and he's yeah, great yeah. at it. <laughs> so the family's terrified. The power goes off and on. The appliances randomly turn on and off. Glass breaks around them. Beams of light shines on them. The floorboards shuffle below them. Very much so like poltergeist. This movie, yeah. So Buddy, he's unnoticed. He goes into Watt's room and finds a broken CB radio, which he then repairs. And then he begins using that ET again. So the translucent tube like tentacles burst through the windows into the kitchen. As Ed shoots it, the tentacles then knock the gun out of his hand and shocks him. I have a recurring nightmare where there's tube tentacles involved, so. That's an awful nightmare. <laughs> yeah. The back door then erupts inward, leaving it open, allowing Jaybird to run and escape. Now Watt takes a horse and rides it out and calls for help. Jaybird lays in the middle of the four ETs as if it was some kind of ritual. Buddy then swoops in, fights off the ETs, and saves Jaybird from being possibly sacrificed. I don't, I don't know what they were going to do with him, but it was going to be bad. It was going to be a sacrifice of some sort. Yeah. Jaybird wanders off and towards the sound of a piano being played by Tess and then is found by Ed. The ETs continue to beat up and chase Buddy. Watt rushes back to the farm, warning everyone that they're up in the sky, just behind him and about 50 feet up in the air in a spacecraft following them. They all hide in the barn as the spacecraft beams a bright light on the ground causing havoc on the farm. The ETs start attacking the barn, demolishing the piano, attempting to run them over with the tractor, creating holes in the walls and in the roof for the ETs to reach in, allowing the tentacles to get back at them again. The rumbling intensifies. Scar and Hoodoo manage to break into the barn just before the ETs are about to attack. Scar barks in order and they grab the tentacles and they get repelled back up into the spacecraft. Everything goes silent. Jaybird wanders off, but this time it's like he's in a trance. He disappears for a moment and reappears with the taller ET named Cypress. Cypress uses Jaybird as a vessel to communicate his message in this broken sentence stating that they understand that they suffer and that they are not alone. Jaybird then turns to each of the family members and individually tells them he loves you. Jaybird collapses on the ground when Cypress lets go. The spacecraft takes off and into space and it's over. The next morning, the family is cleaning and repairing the house. Jaybird is up in his room, finger painting over the celestial map that Buddy had painted with him earlier. Tess is packing her suitcase, which is implying that she's going back to school. Ed takes Jaybird outside. The camera follows a hawk into the sky, much like the opening shot, and tracks along the hawk's shadow to reveal Buddy, who has been left behind. Still alive and stuck on the fucking planet. <laughs> That's nice, guys. That's nice, guys. We're going to go into kind of what happened after that, what was supposed to go into this? Just a quick hot take from everyone. What was your reaction to the story? Is this a movie that you may have wanted to see, or is it kind of better off being split off into the other three movies? As I said at the beginning, E.T. being a movie that I was never really into as much as a kid, I feel like this movie isn't for me as much. There's so much of what is in this movie that has like now been done already that it would feel like this movie is being derivative of the other movies that are actually being derivative of it. Sometimes like you'll watch a classic movie that you've never seen before and it feels unoriginal and uninteresting because a whole bunch of other things already ripped it off and you're so used to the ripoffs that the original just like doesn't have the same weight for you anymore. And that's kind of how I feel about seeing this now. It's like, I've already seen E.T. and I've already seen these kind of ideas show up. I feel like it wouldn't quite work for me. I would want to see it. I think it sounds interesting and their names are funny. <laughs> As long as they're all wearing name tags the whole movie. I think I would have seen this movie. I don't think it would have had a lasting impression on me like the other films would. Like E.T. has a lasting impression, whereas this, I don't actually see that. It was interesting right before we got on this podcast, I was watching Critters because Critters is another one that they feel is derivative of this as is Signs, War of the World. And Critters, that was a movie that was specifically trying not to be Gremlins or E.T. Mm -hmm. I like it. I think you could do it today and it would work. If you had the right people doing it, I think it yeah. could be really good. I'd like to see what John Sayles would do with it now, like if he was directing it, because I think it would be fascinating. 
So let's talk about kind of what happened to this script. While filming Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg received a draft of the script from Sales, which was then retitled to Night Skies. There was a videotape sent to him of the animatronics that Rick Baker had made. Estimated cost about $70,000. For the one. To make the prototype of Scar, like to move around. So that was enough that he knew that he would begin filming Night Skies as soon as he was finished with Indiana Jones. And instead of directing the film, he instead wanted to produce it and gave the directing role to Toby Hooper, who we know directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, although Hooper didn't really seem interested in the extraterrestrial part of the film, so Stephen, he got the assistance from a former animator and film designer, Ron Cobb, who had worked on Sleeping Beauty, Star Wars, Conan the Barbarian, Aliens, and The Abyss. At the current time he was working on Conan the Barbarian, the two had met and had soon started working together on storyboards for Night Skies. Cobb had this to say about their encounter, quote, I would suggest angles, ideas, verbalize the act of directing. Let's do this and do that. And we could go and shoot over his shoulder and then close-ups of the shadow. Steven used a lot of my suggestions and I was very flattered. So Stephen and Ron were on the same page so often that he actually offered Cobbs to direct the film himself. In an LA Times article, Cobbs told them, quote, everyone in Hollywood is waiting for the phone call that will change his life. How many people does that happen to? Steven wants me to direct a movie. I've never directed a movie in my life, and Steven Spielberg wants me to direct a movie. I said, Steven, I don't know if I can direct. Steven's response was simple, get yourself an agent. Obviously, this didn't come to fruition. While Stephen was filming Raiders in North Africa, he began to question night skies. In Neil Sinyard's book, The Films of Steven Spielberg, he talks about this stating, quote, I might have taken leave of my sense. Throughout Raiders, I was between killing Nazis and blowing up flying wings and having Harrison Ford in all of his high serialized adventures. I was sitting there in the middle of Tanzania, scratching my head and saying, I've got to get back to the tranquility, or at least the spirituality, of close encounters. While on the set, Harrison Ford's girlfriend and future wife, Melissa Matheson, she wrote The Black Stallion and The Escape Artist, she came to visit. Stephen then showed her the script for his future movie, knowing that she was a screenwriter, and she told him that the most effective part of the film was actually the relationship between the boy and the alien buddy. She took the last scene of the movie where Buddy was left behind and ran with that concept and made her own draft, which she titled E.T. and Me. That was actually completed within about eight weeks. E.T. was more appealing to Steven Spielberg, especially with the element of the divorced parents. It became more personal. He went to Columbia with a new script, but they did not like the idea. One of the execs actually called this script for E.T., quote, a wimpy Walt Disney movie. Columbia was still pushing for Night Skies and spent about a million dollars in pre-production. They were hellbent on creating the same success they made with Close Encounters. Spielberg went ahead with E.T. the Extraterrestrial. To cut ties with Columbia, he actually paid them a million dollars that they spent on pre-production and got the movie greenlit by Universal Pictures instead. Best move Columbia ever made. (laughs) So they gave Columbia to get out of it. They gave them 5% of E.T.'s profits. Columbia made more money off of E.T. off of the back end than they made all year that year. (laughs) Ooh. E.T. was a smash hit and even grossed higher than Star Wars, which was the highest grossing movie at that time. So, Sales was not bitter about the movie E.T. In fact, he later stated that A Night Skies was much more of a jumping off point than something that was rated from the material. I thought that Matheson had done a great job. Ron Cobbs, on the other hand, he did not like E.T. He actually said it was a sentimental and self-indulgent, a pathetic lost puppy kind of story. He might be a little bitter about it. He did get to direct a movie eventually, and he got to start working on Dark Star. So he was in that with Carpenter and everything. So E.T. premiered in theaters on June 11th, 1982. And just a few days earlier, June 4th, Poltergeist premiered as well. Hooper initially rejected the directing role for Night Skies. He and Spielberg did collaborate a lot in the story of a family getting terrorized by the supernatural. Now, Toby Hooper is credited as the director of the film, but there have been many controversial stories about Stephen 
ghost directing the movie. <laughs> There's a lot of back and forth about it. And it's interesting because it's so Steven Spielberg. To me, it is also very Toby Hooper. If you go and watch Invaders from Mars and you think about yeah. his other work, there was that one person a couple years back who basically was like, yeah, Steven Spielberg really did all of it. But the truth is, it could really go either way. The story that I've heard that I wrote down here is that Steven helped develop the story and the storyboards. And he was pretty much there every single day, all except for three days that he took off to go to Hawaii with George Lucas. While he was on set, he would oftentimes set up the shot. He would give final decisions in each of the scenes. Much of the cast, they did notice Steven's control over the set. But for Hooper, you know what he got to do? He got to yell action and cut. In Toby Hooper's defense, no offense, Steven Spielberg. I think <laughs> that in hindsight, we can say whatever we want to say about it, but none of us were there. That's true. The reports on it are so conflicting. For Steven Spielberg, I feel like as a producer, I think Poltergeist was his first like really big hit because his producing films up until then had just when he wasn't going to direct, that was when people got really spooked with the script. Mm -hmm. Until Poltergeist, he wasn't as big of a producer. So that's what happened with Poltergeist and Hooper. Meanwhile, Chris Columbus was working on a spec script to prove that he was capable of writing. It was a horror comedy about these little creatures who were terrorizing a town titled Gremlins. The inspiration came to him while he was in a loft one night and he heard, quote, what sounded like a platoon of mice come out and hear them skittering around in the blackness. And it was really creepy. Spielberg got a hold of the script stating, it's one of the most original things I've come across in many years, which is why I bought it. To direct the movie, Spielberg hired Joe Dante, who did Piranha and The Howling, because he knew that he was able to handle the material. D. Wallace is The Howling, E.T., and Critters. So D. Wallace Stone is totally like the through line on all of these. They took the script to Warner Brothers and co-produced it under Amblin Entertainment. The script went through many rewrites. In the first draft of the story, it was much darker. Billy's mother was killed by the gremlins and her head was thrown down the stairs when Billy arrived home. The gremlins ate Billy's dog. They also terrorized and ate McDonald's customers. Also, Stripe and Gizmo were actually the same character in the sense that Gizmo would then morph into Stripe, but Spielberg felt that Gizmo needed to stay the same cute character throughout the movie while Stripe led the gremlin army. Uh. This is where elements of the night skies started to leak into the rewrite. So I think the kitchen scene, I believe that Chris Columbus did come up with an original idea, but I think what was going on and David and I have talked about this before. No idea is really thrown away in Hollywood. There's always a good idea somewhere and could be recycled and put into something else. It was in his head. He knew that these were good ideas and he's like, this would fit perfectly here. This would fit perfectly here. And I think it just developed through the rewrites of like, that's what happened. I think those came out of the rewrites and not necessarily out of Chris Columbus's original script. Home Alone is essentially Night Skies to a certain degree. Yeah. And Night Skies has also been referred to as like straw dogs or aliens, alien gremlins. You know, the villain in The Searchers drums along the Mohawk and then the White Dawn. So those were three that were heavily influenced on the Night Sky script. And of course, the thing from another world. <laughs> One last thing about Gremlins to kind of give a nod to E.T. Night Skies. So there's a movie theater marquee and on there is two movies. So it says A Boy's Life, which was the shooting title for E.T., and then they have Watch the Skies, which was the previous title for Night Skies. Although Spielberg seemed pretty adverse to sequels, he did consider making one for an E.T. called Nocturnal Fears. Now, an excerpt from Spielberg in Matheson's treatment read, The evil creatures are carnivorous. Their leader, Corel, commands his crew to disperse into the forest to acquire food. As the squat aliens leave the gangplank, each one emits a hypnotic hum, which has a paralyzing effect on the surrounding wildlife. These creatures are albino fractions, mutations of the same civilization E.T. belongs to. The two separate groups have been at war for decades. Now, Spielberg retracted the idea of the sequel thinking that E.T. worked best as a solo film. So he just kind of left that one alone. This actually brings me to our final and last paragraph. The real winner of this story is Ron Cobb, 
Ron Cobb, if you remember, he was the guy who was offered to be a director that wasn't a director before because his wife, Robin Love, actually read through the contract for Night Skies and found that Ron was owed $7,500 if he was terminated, which he was, so he got $7,500, but he was also owed 1% of the profit from the film that it changed into E.T. the Extraterrestrial, which then grossed around $700 million. So for the years following, he actually became a cartoonist and just did whatever the fuck he wanted to do. And he got paid millions of dollars for not doing a thing. That's amazing. (laughs) That's amazing. And then John Sayles' 1984 film, The Brother from Another Planet, which featured an alien stranded on Earth, also kind of came out of this. So no one really walked away from this without getting something out of it. Cooper got Poltergeist. Cobb got all that money. Like, they got E.T. Columbia got a shit ton of money and got their studio afloat. So it's fine. No one lost because of this movie. It is one of those rare stories of something not getting made, but like, what they will say in this book that I was telling you about is they're like, yeah, the chance of it happening because they predict it on every film, they're like two out of 10. I don't think it'll happen just because so many ideas have been taken out of this movie and put into other movies. I think the only way it could get made is if it was like an intentional nod to this era, like something like Super 8. Yes. I think this is one of the cool things that I did not expect when we started this podcast, but I'm realizing now is like, when I learn film history and go back and watch classic films, it's fun to see like how all of these classic films inspired what we have today. You can kind of like watch that path. And I think the thing that I didn't expect out of this podcast is how movies that are completely unmade also affect the trajectory of filmmaking and the types of movies that get made now. I love that Guillermo del Toro quote about screenwriting where he was like, I have maybe like 20 unmade film scripts. I think about half of our episodes include a sentence of, also Guillermo del Toro was attached to this project. (laughs) (laughs) When we think of Spielberg, we think of the massive films, but like, remember how many things he made starting at a young age that got him there. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Ellis, if people want to find more of what you've got going on, where can they find that? I'm on all the socials. Ellis Charles Hoffmeister. You can hunt me down that way. I can never (laughs) remember what any of my hashtags are. And then I'm on If You Like Movies with Haley Hoffmeister, who was on this podcast as well. I'm also on two other podcasts, Pretty Little Monsters, which is about the television show Pretty Little Liars, (laughs) and Sick Folks of Cinema, which is about horror films. Thank you so much for having me. I've been Haley Hoffmeister. You can see me quite often at Flappers. My Instagram is Haley Hoffmeister, and my Twitter is my name is Haley. Thank you. And you can find episodes of this podcast by checking out our website, pipedreampodcasts.com, where you can also find Come On Fahuqua Pods, The Mystery Shack Look Back, and Escape from Vault Disney. While you're there, you can find links to all of our social media pages, our email address. If you have any other suggestions for movies or corrections, send those emails to notgetmade at gmail.com. We also have a Patreon page. We are so thankful to our patrons who help support this podcast. That's going to go ahead and wrap us up. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 